I will now call to order the public work session of the Portsmouth City Council. I want to thank all of the citizens for coming out today. Our certainly our city staff, invited guests, family and friends. Thank you for being here. Before we get on to the agenda, I would ask that my colleagues please note your attendance electronically. Five members of the city council are present. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mr. Carter, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council members. Thank you for being with us this evening. We have a couple items on the agenda for tonight, uh, one of which is uh, the Hampton Roads Alliance. It's going to give us a briefing on the Eastern Virginia Regional Industrial Facility Authority. This is actually an opportunity for us to uh, make some investments into uh, communities outside of our region that may uh, provide a return for us. But I'm going to ask Mr. Doug Smith, and I think you have a pair of Steves with him, if I remember I that do. right. I think that, I'm, the, uh, I'm the only one in front of you not named Steve tonight. All right. <laughs> so uh, but this Mayor Glover, uh, uh, Vice Mayor Lucas Burke, members of council, uh, Mr. Carter, it's a, a pleasure to be with you and always fun to be back in this room. Again, I'm, I'm Doug Smith with the Hampton Roads Alliance. But I'm going to talk to you tonight about the Eastern Virginia um, Regional Industrial Facility Authority. And I've got my clicker here. Um, I'm going to explain to you what a RIFA is because it is, it is pretty unique, but it's a, something we think if we do this right, it may be the most important regional organization we have in the next five or six years. I'm going to talk to you about who's, who's, in, who's involved, um, a little bit about the governing board, how it's managed, um, how it's funded, how the revenue sharing works. And then um, I'm going to ask uh, Steve Harrison, who's our chief operating officer, to uh, step up and talk about a specific project and sort of what next steps would be. And then the other gentleman with me is uh, Steve Mead, who is the, um, the attorney for the EV RIFA with uh, Pat, uh, Carney, Pat, Patterson, and Mead. So, you know, simply put, a RIFA, so again, Regional Industrial Facility Authority, and don't get too hung up on that industrial word because that's really something that the state code uh, says, but it is, we are not limited to doing uh, industrial projects. Uh, but it's essentially a cooperation agreement, a cooperative agreement among localities that allows a, and it's, it's part of a state statute, but it allows you to cooperate in the development of facilities uh, that are in one city and share in the revenues that are generated. So you can invest in a project in another city. And so in a region like Hampton Roads, where we have some communities that are, that are land rich, uh, but not necessarily cash rich, or some, uh, some communities that are uh, frankly fully developed and don't have an opportunity, it's a chance to uh, come together. Right now, there are 11 other um, RIFAs in the state of Virginia. Most of them are in the western part of the Commonwealth. Uh, and this is just kind of the mechanics of it. Uh, recognized, uh, the EV RIFA was um, re formally recognized in December of 18. Um, it tells you what the act is. It really started on the peninsula, and um, I happened to be, where I was the city manager in Norfolk at the time, and one of the things that, and I'm sure Mr. Carter's starting to figure this out, one of the things that works really well here is the, um, what we call the CAO committee. It's the group of city managers that meets on a very regular basis, and we task the south side communities that were really dealing with sea level rise on a daily basis with some work around uh, recurrent flooding in the peninsula communities. So they explore this RIFA and, and what you can do, and, and they really worked hard, and we'll come back to that. But um, started out, formed this thing, had a, pro a specific project in York County. So York County took the lead. Hampton served as the fiscal agent in the Newport News Economic Development Department, really acted as the staff. In 22, our organization took over the operations. Uh, most all of those communities were members of the alliance. Candidly, they were already investing in us. And so when they came to us and said, would you be willing to take over the operations? We said we'd be thrilled to and uh, didn't charge anything additional to what um, was already uh, being invested with us. You can see who the founding members were, again, uh, predominantly the communities over on the peninsula. Uh, but since then, Chesapeake, Franklin, Virginia Beach, um, Isle of Wight County have all joined, made a similar presentation to, to this one to the Norfolk City Council uh, six or ten weeks ago. Uh, they're going through the process. We believe that they'll, they'll step in next, which really leaves uh, Portsmouth, Suffolk, and Southampton County as the only communities uh, that are not in. 
And this is um, just a, in some ways, several of you, I, I think, have, have been on the, uh, the Planning District Commission. I mean, think of this as a, it's a political subdivision. It's run by primarily elected and appointed officials. Each community appoints a couple of members and a couple of alternates. Um, in terms of policies and procedures, uh, that's who makes the, the decisions about what happens. Is it th this happens to be um, who's on the board um, at this point in time. Um, you all know some of these folks, I'm sure, but it's currently the, the David Meeker from Gloucester is the chairman, and you can see uh, the other officers. It works just like any other uh, organization in terms of an executive committee that, that does work in between meetings, but then the board meets um, on a quarterly basis. Again, in, in 22, we signed a memorandum of agreement with the, the, uh, with the EV RIFA that said we would provide the staffing uh, for the organization. And, and frankly, it aligns perfectly with what we do. So if you think about it, our job is to grow the traded sector um, jobs in the region, to attract business and to grow existing business. A, a challenge Virginia has had over the last uh, two or three decades is development ready sites. And y'all have seen a lot of conversation about preparing sites, getting money from the state of Virginia, um, finally to put money into uh, getting some of these sites ready. We've lost literally billions of dollars of economic development, primarily to the southeast because places like North Carolina and Georgia and Tennessee and Florida have development ready sites where they've spent millions of dollars so that when an automobile manufacturer, a battery manufacturer, somebody comes to town, uh, they have a place to put them. And so, Mr. Whitaker, I to see you. How you doing? Um, um, so, uh, that's an important piece for us. We, we, frankly, we don't, if we don't have product, uh, then we don't have anything to sell. And so there was a nice alignment of the two organizations. In terms of, of joining, and I think this is really sort of the meat of kind of what, what does it mean for you. The, the rules within the, the, um, the RIFA say that if your community has a population of more than 50,000 people, it's a $4,000 fee to join. It's a $2,000 fee to join if you're less than uh, 50,000 people. And then, um, uh, excuse me, those are, your oper those, are, those are your annual dues. The joining fee for you all would be $2,500. So as a large community, you would join for $2,500 and then pay $4,000 a year uh, to be a member. As I said, the Alliance did not charge any fees uh, for the operations. And um, I'll talk to you about sort of individual projects. This, this is, again, this is how it works. Essentially, you have the opportunity to either invest in a project in another community. You choose whether you want to do that or you don't want to do that. And frankly, this body makes that decision, not your members on the commission. They, they carry out um, your wishes for you. Um, uh, and then um, uh, if you don't want to participate, you simply don't participate. Um, I'm going to ask, um, it, the, the first project we've had is something called Kings Creek Commerce Center up in York County. It's a really interesting project that, frankly, York County had been working with the state since the 90s to try to get hold of this piece of property. And I want, this is Steve Harrison, who's our chief operations officer. I want him to just walk you through what's happened with that, because it, it's an excellent example of sort of how this thing can work. Good evening, members of council. Um, the Kings Creek Commerce Center, uh, as Doug mentioned, it really was a property that the York County uh, officials had been hoping to develop for a, a few decades um, and had been working with the state because it was state surplus property. It was a surplus fuel depot. Um, and they decided to, to talk to the state about what if we formed a RIFA um, and then you're not selling it to one community, you're selling it to a region. And the state liked that idea a lot better. Um, and so they agreed that if, if these communities formed a RIFA and sort of co-invested in the project, um, that they would sell the Kings Creek Commerce Center to the RIFA. And so um, it is a 432 acre parcel um, that they closed on in December of 2021. And the funding for the property um, was actually immediately mitigated by leasing half of the property to Dominion for a solar farm. So the purchase price and then the lease price that they negotiated with Dominion were exactly the same. Um, so essentially everything after that uh, becomes potential profit. Um, they have also secured a Go Virginia grant to do some due diligence on the site and, and look at opportunities to increase its tier level on the Virginia, Virginia Business Ready Sites uh, program ratings. 
Uh, and it, it really has been to great success. So in June of, of this year, a company called Distribution Realty Group that does primarily um, warehousing and distribution um, operations all over the country uh, executed a contract with the RIFA for 30 acres of the 80 acres that are developable. Um, and so we're going through the due diligence with them now and really hopeful to close on that and start developing um, the first project at Kings Creek very shortly. Uh, and so six communities are currently members of the Kings Creek Commerce Center. And so we say you know, when, when a project lands at this site, it's not a win for one community, it's a win for six. Um, and so these communities chose how much to put in on an annual basis. They all have a member who sits on the Kings Creek Commerce Center committee. Um, and they negotiated together uh, on what these various amounts would be. And then they will receive tax revenue um, proportional to how much they invested uh, once the revenues start pouring in from these different uh, projects that they land. And so just a, as an example of a future project, essentially if a community was to bring a project to the RIFA and say that they would like to solicit co-investment, um, you all would really just have two options. So option A would be you decide to join uh, the project and you would determine how much you wanna put in on an annual basis and then you would be able to appoint a member to that committee um, to sit uh, and determine the sort of things that go before the board uh, for approval. But Option B would be if it's not something that interests the city of Portsmouth, you could choose not to participate. You'd still sit on the EV RIFA board and be briefed on the project every meeting and, um, and vote on certain things about the project, but you just would not sit on the subcommittee for that individual project. So it really is almost a, a no risk proposition in that way. Every project that is presented to the RIFA, you have the option to join or to not join. And so to join the RIFA is also a fairly, fairly easy process. Um, so what we would, would ask is that city council consider adopting a resolution to join the EV RIFA. Um, and Mr. Mead, our attorney, um, could work with your city attorney to provide some draft language of what the other communities have, have adopted with the resolution. And then at the next EV RIFA board meeting, they would take up that resolution and would vote to admit Portsmouth as the newest member of the RIFA. And then after that, Portsmouth would appoint two primary members and two alternate members, um, which would be determined by this council um, and can be uh, adapted or changed as needed. And with, um, with that, this is just a quote from Mayor West. Um, when Chesapeake joined, he talked about the idea of this really being regionalism in action. This is sort of putting your money where your mouth is on the regionalism side of things because you have the opportunity for a transformative economic growth when potentially 15 communities could come together and co-invest in a project and then share in the revenues associated with the win. Um, so we're, we're really excited about the potential that this has. As Doug said, it, there really is transformative opportunities for this to be one of the most important regional entities that, that Hampton Roads has. Um, we've seen it successful in other parts of the state and we're excited to, to create the biggest RIFA in Virginia with this many communities. Um, so with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. So I'd, I'd, I'd close maybe with, with where we opened, which is, um, I think one of the challenges we have in Virginia in economic development is there tend to, in terms of localities, there tends to be winners and losers. When a project lands in Chesapeake, Chesapeake gets those revenues. Portsmouth does not. Um, and sometimes, you know, communities are providing services that, that support that. This is an opportunity for localities to invest in a project in another region and get that return. So if you looked at that example of, William, here's Williamsburg, who's, you know, essentially developed, and they've got about 20% of a deal in York County. So it's pretty interesting. So they'll share in the sale of the land. They'll share and the ongoing revenue. So Steve said, happy to answer uh, questions or uh, would love some comments or discussion. Councilman Moody, sir, you have the floor. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, uh, Doug. Uh, what's the formula on the return on yeah. investment? Yeah, so that's negotiated on each project. So, that, so in Kings Creek, there, there's a group. So you, let, let's just say there's a project comes up and you've got ABC piece of property in either Portsmouth or in another community. That, that group is going to negotiate uh, what that return is going to be and would allow you to say, you know what, Portsmouth's going to put in 20% of the money. We're going to get 20% of the return. Or perhaps a host community says, we're gonna, we, we think as a host community, we should have a little bit of, more of a return. But that's negotiated on each deal. Now, is that negotiated by the investment group Correct. or the, the membership? By the membership. 
Okay. When you say, so let me make sure we're saying the same thing. When you say invest, there's a committee, so let's just call it a, you know, Project X, and five communities say we're going in on, on Project X. Those five communities are going to determine that, what that looks like. Right. And, and if you're a member, you don't have to be an investor on a particular project. Sector. That's correct. That's okay. correct. So we've, got, we've done the one project, and not everybody participated. Okay, so, so the investors determine uh, what, the, uh, what the breakdown is going to be. So, I mean, it, is there a formula based on, like this project, uh, your county invested 20,000 20, and Hampton 5 and Precocin 2,500. Right. So, different enough, each one gets a different return based okay. on that investment as determined by the group of investors? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Did you add anything to that? Dr. Whitaker, you have the floor, sir. Yes. Um, in your presentation, <clears throat> when you're speaking of what is a RIFA, mm -hmm. I'm just curious, uh, who, are, who are the partners or investors uh, in the development other than the localities? Um, it really depends. Each project can be a little bit different, but it, it, because you actually can have a private owner as an investor. We're so, we, we, can the Dr. Whitaker, we're still learning some of these things. Um, but as it sits right now, the expectation is, for example, the, the, the Berry Hill project in Danville, which is a 3,000 acre project. You had two counties come together, do a lot of work with the Tobacco Commission. And that's who's come together to get that project development ready, and those folks will share in that piece. But it's those communities that are making those decisions. So how is a RIFA any different than a public-private it's, go, it's going across jurisdictional lines. Yeah, but That's, I mean, yeah. isn't it still you're involved in uh, public dollars and also with private investors? Isn't that basically certainly the can be? So, yeah, certainly can be. I, and I, I would absolutely think of it as a um, as a public. I, I would think of it more as a joint development authority well, than a public private. Well, the investors are private entities involved. If in the case of no no different than if you sell a piece of property to somebody in Portsmouth. As, as the city is involved and, and they're the, a private investor, you're correct. Yes, but I'm saying with, with this, if it's a development that's taking place, uh, according to what I thought you were saying, that there would be some private investors involved on the development side. That's correct. And then you would also be using public dollars on the locality side. Yes, sir. So how is that? Any, that's, it's just a public-private. Yeah, I don't know that it's any different. It's just it's a it's a tool that allows you to bring multiple jurisdictions in as opposed to one jurisdiction. Yes, yeah, it's, it's just that these public-private partnerships um, seem like Portsmouth has ended up on the wrong side of the deal on those. Okay. Uh, also, um, I'm just curious what is what is the basis for revenue sharing? Uh, is it is it revenue sharing that's taking place? Is it net profit sharing that's taking place? And who determines that formula? So, so the, the, the group that's investing, so let's just say, again, it's, it's Project X. Five communities decide they're going to invest. Those, and let's say Portsmouth's one of them. You're going to be at the table deciding what that looks like and then deciding whether you want to invest or not. Yeah. So who, de who determines the formula for uh, how much this private entity gets versus the different localities? Who, who determines the, the, that? that? That committee. So let's so play it out. So let's just say in that case, there's a, um, um, let's just call it a, a developer um, developing a piece of property. In this case, instead of one locality, let's say it's five localities, you're going to negotiate a, um, in your words, and I think you're right, public-private partnership with that development group. And then that body of, mem of um, investors, th those five communities, are going to decide what they'll approve as a project that works for them or, or a um, um, relationship that works for them. Right? So, we, so, we'll, so we, as your staff, just like what happens here, we as your staff would go and negotiate with somebody, we, you would say, hey, this group's come in and wants to buy this piece of property under these conditions. We would work through what those conditions would be, bring that back to that, that committee for that project, and that committee would say, yeah, we want to do that, or no, we don't want to do that. Yeah, and then who, of, of these entities, who has control over who you're contracting with? Those, those, those communities, it's got to be, a, it's a, Steve, it's got to be a unanimous vote from those committees. So in, that, in, yeah. my, in my story of five communities, those five communities have to say, yes, 
We want to do that. If, if it, let's just say Portsmouth's in that deal and you don't like that deal, you vote no and that deal doesn't happen. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Vice Mayor Lucas Burke, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for the presentation. Yes, I know we had talked about this um, sometime earlier in the year, so I'm glad to mm -hmm. see the presentation come across. Um, my line of questioning mm -hmm. is under funding as well. So say if there's a project that's coming in, you have the five member jurisdictions mm -hmm. that are involved and the project is too big for the members right. to invest in, where, where does the additional funding come from or do you just halt? Well, you may, you may not have a project, but okay. let's say, so like for example, I, I think I'm gonna be in New Kent County next week. New Kent County has recently joined the Alliance. We're hopeful G New Kent County will join the river because New Kent County has a lot of land, mm -hmm. right? But they're mm -hmm. a very small community, 26,000 people. They don't necessarily have the funds to do the infrastructure. So in that, in that, in, in my story there, you know, Portsmouth, Norfolk, Newport News may want to go in and, and invest. Now, the, the, the deal has to work. You know, if, if you try to put a deal together and we don't have enough public investment from those three communities to do whatever it is to make the deal work, then the, then the deal doesn't work. But it could be you could involve the state. You know, I, I think one of the things I think you'll see us talk, I was, we were talking with Brian Donahue in the hall. I think one of the things you'll see us do next year is take, we have something called the Red Team, which is all of the economic development directors. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to do next year is we're going to take that red team and those members that are um, in the RIFA are going to meet each month. And we're going to talk about kind of where this thing is going because it's, it's new. So we're, kinda, we're figuring out what we're going to do. I think one of the things that we've got to do is be really deliberate on how we get the state is putting out a fair bit of what they call business ready sites money, right? And it's going all over the state. We need to make sure Hampton Roads gets its fair share of that money. I think this is a mechanism to do that. So one of the things we want to do is say the RIFA really starts to think through how should we get that money? Where, where should that money go? And honestly, the way that money has gone into Hampton Roads to date, it's been what community had matching funds, mm -hmm. not necessarily what community had the, the best site. Right. Okay, yeah, and that was my second question. Does the state provide any funding towards any of these projects as well? And if you're not a member, then you don't get to participate in the, the funding allocation. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay, well, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Councilman Hugo, sir, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Smith, good evening. Thanks for being here. Oh, great to see you. So um, I want to zero in on Kings Creek Commerce Center just as yeah. an example because you put all the information here. So there's there's uh, six localities, and between them they're putting in 47.5 a year, and they've been doing that, I guess, since 2021. I'll get you to help me. Yes, sir. Okay, so 21, two, three, four. So four years of 47,005. How, how did that group decide 47,005 a year? How long does the 47,005 a year last? Where, what, what are you using? The, what does the group use the money for? Sure. So, so I'm just interested in kind of the mechanics of this particular project since it happens to be the one that you're right. involved in. So Mr. In. Mead's been there since the inception, so I'm going to yeah. let him answer that. Thank you, Doug. Good afternoon. Um, so really, the uh, how we set the 47.5 was we did a budget based on what we thought we'd have to do. We have to maintain a dam. We have to have insurance and, and certain things to maintain the property. We also have certain cap requirements. It was an environmental site. It has a corrective action plan. So there's certain things that we're paying each year, and so that's really where the 47.5 came from. At the point we're ready for a particular uh, project on the site, for example, a building, then there's a possibility we'd need to put in more funds, and the, the six localities in this instance would decide that. But that's where the 47.5 came from. You're exactly right so far. It's sitting there in our account. Just, um, you know, we have it ready, and we're using it for some engineering, some pre-engineering for some development, and we're using it for the prospect we have with DRG, who signed the contract with us as well. And, and so did the state just give you the property? No, or sir. We bought it for $1.35 million, but we got that same cash. So the 47.5 is apparently being used for loan payments as well as maintenance on the property, or how did you pay for the property? We actually worked an upfront lease with Dominion. It was a predecessor to Dominion, but that ground lease was for $1.35 million as well. We knew the price from the state. We worked toward that number. So we basically have 70000 cash basis into the project and no debt on it. Okay. Half that property is a solar farm today. 
Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. And are there other projects out there in the in the hopper, twinkle in the eye stage, or or I mean, it's been since 2018 since you've been doing this, and and only one project that's four years along. Yeah. So part of so what we need is. Um, frankly, for some of the localities to step forward and say this is something we want to do. But what we've done is um, we hired, our, the Alliance hired KPMG to come in and, and do what we're calling a, an industrial sites strategy. So as I said earlier, the strategy in Hampton Roads has been sort of what community had the money and that's who got to, to right. develop. And so what we asked KPMG to come in is and say, what are our best sites? We got them to look at about 15 different sites and look at them as if they were a site consultant. So they literally... Acted, and they are site consultants, but they called up the economic development office as if they were somebody interested in the piece of property, said, I'm interested in this piece of property. What can you tell me about it? Kind of graded, frankly, the folks on the information that was available, how that was conveyed. And, and we've got a sheet on each one of those properties and uh, sort of what, what it takes to make that property development ready, what makes it attractive from a marketing standpoint. So we're now going to bring that back to the RIFA and start and to, to start talking about, all right, these are what we think some of the opportunities are. Should we go in on this project or that project? But we're just, just getting into those conversations. And you're doing the marketing then of those properties? Correct. Well, we are in the in the um, in the locality is and the state is. Remember, you've got the Virginia Economic Development Partnership. You've got us, and you've got, in your case, Brian and his team. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Tillage. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Smith, it's always good seeing you. Thank um, you. I want to uh, first say I think this is a great opportunity for a locality such as Portsmouth, um, especially with it being a landlocked city. Um, and the opportunity to be able to reach beyond our city limits to, you know, hopefully do some revenue sharing. Um, Councilman Hugo kind of addressed most of my questions I had in regards to the money and how that is being spent and, you know, where it goes. Um, but for the membership localities, is there an annual membership in addition to this, or are we only, is it just pay as you go? So that's the, the 2500 to join and then $4,000 a month. And what that pays for, we, we, we got to get an audit every year. That audit costs $12,000. We've got to get a little bit of insurance, different things. So you're paying, you're not paying anything to, to us, mm -hmm. but there are some basic expenses, but it's, it's pretty nominal. Okay. Thank you. And, and again, I go back to, you talk about it perfect for Portsmouth, like Portsmouth and, and this came up for a lot of conversation at the Norfolk presentation. Um, I think this is a tool for redevelopment and we got to figure that out, right? But I mean, some of these redevelopment projects are really expensive, right? Because you're, you're, you got to take down buildings, you got to do different things. And, and I'm not sure in, in some of the big ones that really ought to happen that a, that a, a single locality can handle that, right? Councilman Moody, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one additional question. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, leaving the group, mm -hmm. uh, you you join at your will and, and leave at your own will. You know, we haven't had that happen. So, Mr. Mr. Mead, I make the assumption that, that if anybody wants to leave, they simply tell us they want to leave, but I'm going to let the lawyer answer that. <laughs> Mr. Moody, the, the act actually provides an exit mechanism, and if you want to leave, you can leave at any time there's a dissolution, or you also have the right to leave at any time with approval of the majority. Really, on your exit, you just pay for that year and the following year, whatever your obligations were, and if you've done any loans that as part of your loan, then you would pay for that. But that's the only restrictions on exiting. But you're in the deals that are you're in the place. You're in the deals that are, yes, that's right. You're in the deals that are ongoing if you've decided to participate in a particular project. So, so you, if you do exit, you, you pay any portion of uh, your prior commitment on in, any uh, loans, outstanding loans? Yes, sir. That's right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Dr. Whitaker, you have the floor, sir. Yeah. So at, at the end of the transaction, who ends up being the owner? So it really depends on the deal. So I will tell you, we've had, we've had some conversations, for example, and this is where I think things get really interesting. A couple of the communities have said, you know, if I do this project, uh, I don't know that I want the RIFA to have the share in the revenues in perpetuity, right? That's one thing that could happen. And they may say, you know what, I think we ought to have a 30-year sunset or a 20-year sunset where everything kind of, everybody gets their money to certain levels, and then from then on, the host community makes its money. Or it could be in, in perpetuity. So that's going to be different 
in every deal. Mm -hmm. So it, I, I suspect what I think is in most deals, a private entity is going to end up owning that land. But but you may deal, do a deal that's a hundred year land lease, and yeah, then at so, the end of the, so yeah. if. If it's to be a benefit to yeah. uh, Portsmouth yeah. and this great revenue, and yeah. Portsmouth's not even the owner of it, um, the I assume that there's um, potential to be different investors and partners in it, which means they have different ownership shares. So therefore, when someone pulls out of the deal or decides to sell it, where would the locality stand in that regard as to when it comes to the revenue sharing or even yeah, if so they're going to be a part of it? Let me it's, tell you what I, It just yeah. seems like it's, um, it, it sounds good on yeah. paper, but again, I say it's public-private. Yeah. Portsmouth hasn't done well with that. And then you have these entities that uh, have some ownership interests that Portsmouth doesn't have per se, and yet you can have a cash-out event uh, by any of these partners at any time it may be beneficial to them. And I'm not clear how yeah. that puts a locality in a, in a good stand. All right, so let me tell you what I think I'm hearing you say and, and, see, and make sure this, this tracks. So there's, there's a project, uh, developer owns this, call it a building. Um, you're, you've, you've put money in for infrastructure to make that building happen. Uh, there's been a land sale. You've shared in some of the revenues from that land sale. Now you're sharing in the tax revenue that's coming off and that, that real estate investment trust or whatever it is says, you know what, I've made my return. I'm selling. I'm out. And they cash out. The building is still in that scenario. Is that Am I getting that right or more well, or less? The thing is, I'm not clear where the locality, and, and it may require further yeah, information, sure. and we're not going to decide it sure. tonight, but no, no, it's no. just not clear on that ownership interest and also um, that, that whole revenue sharing piece right. is, is, is a little cloudy there. So um, I'm, I get until it. we get that yeah. information, I couldn't say that that's a good deal or, or that it's not. And... Like I said, it's a public-private type right. of thing. So maybe maybe this is the best way to say. It. I think w what we want you to do is have it, it, by joining, it gives you the opportunity to be at the table. You choose whether or not you want to be in a deal or not be in that deal. Each you're going to evaluate each one of those deals to determine whether you think it's a good deal or it's not a good deal. And if you think it's not a good deal or or Portsmouth's not in a position to make that investment at that point in time, you just don't play. So what, but, but right now you don't have the opportunity to play. Are those all the questions from my colleagues? Seeing none. Mr. Smith, thank you uh, for the presentation. You are certainly welcome. And um, that will be all, sir. It's always a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Manager Carter, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Um, Next presentation uh, is uh, surrounding the uh, ordinance to authorize Portsmouth Public Schools to establish a capital reserve fund. Uh, one of the things I'm going to ask before we get started is does everybody have a copy of the proposed ordinance? If you do not I have copies with me, I can provide that, but I just want to make sure that's a yes or a no? No. Okay. All right. What you have in front of you is a copy of an ordinance that has the parameter uh, framework to establish the discussion this evening. One of the things that we're looking at doing is trying to put some, uh, some guidelines into the process of how it will be done and how it will be executed uh, from this point forward. Uh, Dr. Bracey um, has prepared some information uh, that him and his board would like to share with us. If you don't mind coming forward, I'd like to get their input before uh, we actually get started on the presentation. I met with Dr. Bracey earlier today. We kind of discussed this whole process. Uh, hopefully, um, and I say that uh, optimistically, that uh, I'm, I'm new to the process. I, let me say it this way. Um, there's a dance that's been happening with uh, the council and the, board and the school board. Uh, for some time. I'm, I'm the only one that don't know what the steps of the dance is and stepping on people's toes as I'm trying to figure this out. So, but hopefully uh, this board and the school board would allow 
myself and Dr. Bracey to kind of spear through this process and maybe we can get to a point where we're not doing this type of dance, but we have something in place that worked. That was the discussion that we had today. And I'm, and I'm hopeful, again, optimistic that we can get to something of that nature as we move through this. Yeah. Thank you, Manager Carter. Dr. Whitaker, you have the yes, floor. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Carter. Um, that, that's why I sent the email that I sent to council. Um, we are always looking to foster a positive relationship with the school system. And so I thought it would be pertinent that before council gets too involved in a discussion that uh, Dr. Bracey and his staff uh, would review it first and that that conversation, negotiations, discussions would occur between management. And then once they are on equal terms, then it would come to council so there wouldn't be this type of dance that you're talking about because um, we always want to keep things in a positive stance with the school system. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Welcome, Dr. Patillo, Dr. Bracey, and CFO Falk. It's a pleasure to see you all. And I'm looking forward to this spirited conversation that we're gonna have. Absolutely. You have the floor, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, members of City Council, City Manager as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the invitation. I want to extend the invitation. Uh, thank you to the mayor uh, for uh, calling and extending the invitation to come and speak. Uh, just to give some credence to this conversation and to piggyback on what the city manager just stated, um, every year it seems to be an uh, elongated discussion uh, based on the reappropriation of unspent or unencumbered funds back to the school division. Uh, recently, we sent over uh, three requests, one being the ordinance to automatically have unspent funds returned back to the school division at the end of every year. Also, a request for reappropriation of funds that normally includes grant funds, textbook funds, also general fund, risk management funds to go along with that. Uh, this year, we sent a reappropriation request to return 9.9 .9 million of unspent funds to the school division. And one of my reasons for being here is to answer any questions as well. Uh, I see so many things on social media as questions, things floating around uh, through emails. But we have 9.9 .9 million of unspent funds that we asked to be reappropriated. 7.8 million of those funds were from vacancy savings for positions that were not filled during the school year. Uh, because of the teacher shortage across the nation, all school divisions have vacancy savings. Ours tended to be 7.8 million of 9.9 .9 million. In good faith to our teachers who remain with the school division, we felt it was only appropriate to ask for that money to be reappropriated to provide retention, retention bonuses for all staff because they chose to stay in Portsmouth. They could have easily went to Chesapeake, Virginia Beach, or Norfolk, but they chose to stay. We also sent a request for action on our compensation study that was recently completed. And the importance of the compensation study is this, and I'm glad we have the public here as well listening and also watching. Our teachers have not had a step increase in salary since 2016. 2016. We've, we've tried to fill in gaps and patch holes with raises here of 2%, sometimes 1.5%. But in order for us to remain competitive with our neighboring school divisions, it's only right that we take action on that compensation study. What happens here in Portsmouth, we all start out well. We're the highest paying school division for first year teachers. But once you get past year five, we become the bottom of the school division. And it's only right that teachers who've been in our division for 20 years have their just pay. Those who've been in our division for 12 years have their just pay because they choose to stay to teach our babies here in the city of Portsmouth. So we've asked for action on that as well. After careful consideration with our attorney, also myself personally making calls to the Attorney General's office, the Virginia ordinance is clear, statute is clear, that we can have a capital improvement fund with end of the year unspent funds. We're only asking that the council will work with us and partner with us to make that a reality. I invite you all to take a tour with me in any school so you can see the improvements that are needed. You can ask me 
about the sewage issues at West Haven that continue to happen every year. Sewage issues at Hodges Manor. Cracks in the walls and floors and foundation of some of our, pr our proudest schools, like Church and Elementary. Yes. We need the Capital Improvement Fund. We believe you are our partners. We don't want to haggle every year. I believe you all have good faith in what you want to do with the school division. We're just asking for a smoother process that we can partner together. We don't come for a fight. That's the public that makes a fight out of us. We're looking to be stronger partners together because your kids attend our schools. Your businesses are going to come because our schools are doing better. So we're just asking that you all would give us a chance to have a smoother transition when it comes to unencumbered funds at the end of the school year. And we're here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Chairman Patillo. Now, I just want to ask a question before we get to the questions from my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Did you want to go through your presentation or the presentation sure. we have before and, us? And we made it quick, about five slides. Right. Do that. I, I just wanted to make sure we were giving you an opportunity to do that, sir. Yes, sir. Just if there are any questions about why we're asking for this request. Thank you, sir. Let me go to the next slide. The state code is simple. Any school board may, with the concurrence of the local governing body, establish a capital reserve fund as a savings account to which it exclusively deposits the unexpended local operating funds described in subsection A for future school division capital expenditures at no additional cost to taxpayers. It won't cost the taxpayers anything additional. We're just asking to save funds that are not spent. Next slide. <clears throat> What's the benefit of the capital reserve fund? What I just stated, improve infrastructure. Having a capital reserve allows for ongoing maintenance and upgrades to schools and facilities. Emergency needs. Having a capital reserve fund addresses unexpected repairs or improvements ensuring that schools remain safe and functional. Streamline staff time. Having a capital reserve fund can reduce the administrative burden for city and schools by reducing the number of budget revisions and funding requests. Next slide. What type of projects could these actually fund? HVAC projects. We've all heard of issues with air quality and mold in some of our older buildings. Those can be reduced and solved by renewing HVAC projects. Roof replacements. We've, we've been blessed to be able to replace the roof on West Haven recently. That's only one of many schools that need to have their roofs replaced. And electrical upgrades. Most of our schools are at least 50 to 55 years of age. Electricity in 1960 and the current 1960, the usage is not the same it is in 2024. We need to have those replaced. Next slide. Establishment of a capital reserve fund is believed a capital reserve fund would be mutually beneficial for both the city and school division as two governing bodies. And I want to stop at that first paragraph, that first sentence. We would love to function in partnership as two governing bodies. But at times when we have to come and continually ask for this, it seems as though we're a department and not a governing body. And we choose to be a partner as a, an elected governing body, which a Virginia statute grants us that power over our school division. A capital reserve fund will help expedite the process to address division needs with the funds the city has already allocated for the division to use. That's a misconception in the public. Whenever we ask for a reappropriation, we're not asking for anything additional we're just asking for you to give us back what you've already given us. Why? Because the state asks that we give it back if it's not spent by, ju by June 30th of every year. Next slide. Thank you. And then we entertain any questions. Dr. Whitaker, you have the floor. Uh, yes, um, uh, Dr. Patillo, to Dr. Bracey, Mr. Falk, um, we, some of us up here understand the urgency of what you're saying. And again, I am in full support of the request that you've made. The uh, Capital Reserve Fund is, is, is something that uh, this council uh, needs to do. The language that 
is before us on the ordinance. That's what I want to make sure that the school division is in agreement with as we move forward um, because the concept of the reserve fund, uh, I think that's something that is needed. Um, we realize the importance of funding our school system because uh, actually there was a citizen early voting today asking about it. The cuts that the state did to the school system in 2008. Eight. Those millions of dollars have never been returned to the localities. And so that puts an extra burden on the locality and elections have consequences. And we have to make sure that we are funding the gaps that are there. And so I'm in full support. I just wanna make sure that the school division is in agreement with the language that is here because I do see us as uh, a partnership and I see you as a entity that governs the school and not a department. And so I think that's what we need to make sure we're, we're clear on this language. Thank you, sir. Councilman Tillard, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Dr. Pilatillo, I also concur with uh, Dr. Whitaker. Um, being a former school board member, I understand the urgent need of our schools. Uh, it's been something that's been ongoing for a long time. Our school staff are underpaid, um, and I definitely think it's time for uh, city council and school board to come together as governing bodies. Uh, when I got on city council a year and a half ago, I called for that. I also called for the capital uh, fund investment, and so I'm glad that here we are a year and a half later. Uh, it's unfortunate that we're having the conversation a year and a half later, but I'm glad that we're here now having this so that we can move forward in the future, um, ensuring that our school division is taken care of and ensuring that this back and forth of having to come back to city council every year for needs that haven't gone anywhere. I mean, roofs are still uh, messed up, HVAC are still messed up, and that's because you all haven't had the appropriate dollars to get it done. And so hopefully moving forward, um, having uh, our city manager, uh, Mr. Carter, and uh, Superintendent Bracey to have those conversations, I think is very vital in that. And so I look forward to that and I do support um, this ordinance and I'm glad to hear that uh, the school division supports it as well. Thank you, sir. Councilman Hugel, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dr. Patillo, Dr. Bracey, Mr. Falk, thanks for coming tonight and uh, engaging us in this conversation. Thanks also to my colleagues for agreeing to put this on the agenda. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you Pull up some slides for me, please. So I shared this with uh, Mr. Falk yesterday at the, uh, at the school board liaison meeting. Uh, and uh, what, what I've done here is I've gone back through city council minutes for the last three years uh, for the sessions where we took the vote on rolling over the general fund uh, surplus. And so the numbers that I put here are right out of the city council minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, two years ago, uh, we uh, rolled over 3.8 million of encumbered and 7.4 million of unencumbered. And out of that 7.4 million, 4.4 went to CIP projects, very similar to what you described, Dr. Patillo, as so a HVAC and roofs, that kind of stuff, kind of a hodgepodge of CIP. Right. Uh, last year, um, again, you can see the numbers. Uh, the important number here is uh, the unencumbered budget surplus. Last year was 11.2 million. Mm -hmm. Nine million of that was rolled over for CIP. Now, this CIP was different than what you've described. This CIP went as a down payment on the the PACE, the CTE High School, the CET Center. Uh, so that didn't cover HVAC or or roofs or anything that was was all dedicated to, uh, to to the CTE center and then a portion of it last year went to staff bonuses very similarly to what you're proposing uh, when we vote later on this evening so that vote this evening uh, when we get to the, uh, to the to the council agenda meeting uh, we're looking at 9.9 .9 million of uh, unencumbered rollover you all have proposed 3.9 million of that to go to CIP, to CIP projects. So, so again, the, what you've outlined is roofs and the kind of things that you've talked about in your brief. 
and then another six million dollars to staff retention bonuses. So why did I go through all this uh, digging to, to help try just try to understand myself? What what have we been doing uh, mm -hmm. over time? A couple things. So you, you'll note um, last year the rollover was uh, of unencumbered reflected 6.2 percent of the total budget. This year, the rollover reflects about 5% of the total budget. That's interesting, but what's really interesting is $11 million was rolled over and $9.9 .9 million was, is proposed to be rolled over. And by the way, I'm gonna vote for rolling the money over, so, so I'm not going through all this to explain why I'm voting no. Right. I'm going through this to explain why I'm voting yes mm -hmm. and why I wanna do the the uh, proposed ordinance, but I want to put some guardrails on the proposed ordinance, and and I'm using this as a setup to help under uh, to explain why. So so these are all numbers. This is all fact. This all came out of uh, ordinances that were passed the last two years, and the ordinance that is in front of us uh, right now. Can you uh, flip to the next slide, please? Okay. So so here's where I'm into. I want to put some guardrails into this ordinance. So uh, since I've been on city council, the uh, budget page on the school system website has had at the bottom of it, the currently adopted school budget is, the page is under construction, come back later. So in the two years that I've been on city council, I've still never seen a budget a school system budget before we were asked to approve it. And so I shared with my council colleagues, I'm a little, uh, I, I'm concerned about that. I was uneasy about it during budget time, but by the time we get around to having the joint school board and city council meeting, hey, it's uh, too late to be digging into budget detail. You've given us, uh, a, a, here, here's the, what we need and we can take it or we can leave it. Well, we're gonna take it because we need you all to be successful in teaching our kids uh, in, in a successful way. But go to the next slide, please. So this is what happened this past spring, okay? Uh, Dr. Bracey presented to you all, and I was at that meeting, and then to us all, you and us, the uh, superintendent estimate of needs. So about a 12 slide slideshow. That superintendent estimate of needs discussed in detail $19.7 million of items that are in the currently approved school system budget. What it did not discuss is $190 million. That's the blue part, okay? The 19.7 is the, is the frosting on the cake, okay? But, but we never talked about the cake. We never got into detail about the cake. I have no idea what's in the cake. So, as an example, go back to the very first slide, please. So the, uh, the encumbered budget surplus, those items, were they in your budget? I asked that to Mr. Falk yesterday during our school board liaison meeting and he assured me that they were, but my response to him was, I shouldn't have to ask you that question. I should be able to go to your budget and see that those items were in there, but I never got to look at, and nobody up here has ever looked at the details of your budget. Okay, and then down on the CIP line. So the roofs and the HVAC and whatnot, those aren't emergency things. Those are things that you presumably have been planning for, but when I go to the, C the uh, city's CIP budget book, I don't find those CIP projects listed in there. And so I asked Mr. Falk about that yesterday and he said, well, we've submitted them and, and we don't know what happens to them then. But some, some place, somehow, between you guys and us guys, the things that you need to have done in the buildings are not making it into the CIP book and that's a problem because now we're getting ready to create a reserve fund and we ought to be spending the reserve fund on things that are identified ahead, planned ahead, so that when it comes time to ask for the money, we're actually ready to cut a contract to turn a roofer loose to go do, to go do the job instead of 
getting to the that point and saying, okay, now we need, need a roof and let's get the city engineer involved and let's start the whole process to get about uh, doing roof replacement. Now, so, so I outline all this, not as criticism, but I, I said during the budget review process back in the springtime when we were looking at your budget, the process that we, you guys and us guys are using, particularly on CIP, it's not working for you. That's crystal clear because if it was, you wouldn't have asked for an ordinance to give you some freedom to do CIP stuff. It's also not working for us because we need to be able as a, as a governing body for the entire city to take a look at your CIP priorities and fold them into the sewer line replacement priority and the paving of the street priority and the, the replacement of uh, the public safety center priority. So, so that is going to require us all to behave differently than we have been behaving. So whether it's the dance that the city manager spoke to or the dance that you spoke to, frankly, I'm just tired of dancing and I just want to do it the right way. And there's a pretty easy way to do it. You know what your needs are. At the end of the day, the city manager and his budget person has to fold your needs into the priorities of the city. Let's get the right people together around the table like soon for next budget season so that we're building an integrated priority list of, of CIP. And so my, my feedback to the manager, because he asked us to give him some comments back on the draft ordinance, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm with, I'm with uh, Dr. Whitaker and Councilman Tillage. Uh, the, the next step really needs to be the manager and the superintendent kind of getting together and working their way through this language but I provided some feedback. So here's some feedback that I want you to consider. From those numbers, it appears to me, and there's a, there's a blank that has to be filled into this ordinance, how much can we put into this each year? So I suggested, based on these numbers, $5 million a year. Because if we gave you $5 million of CIP to uh, our budget surplus to roll over, that would cover the 4.4 million from two years and the 3.9 million this year, which is, I mean, $5 million is going to buy roofs and HVAC and that kind of stuff. Another blank that has to be filled in is what's the maximum amount of money that we can plunk into this fund ever? And my suggestion was $20 million. Uh, somebody will ask, well, where'd you come up with that number? Um, I pulled it out of my keister, okay? But here's the, here, here's the rationale. Um, we're not ready to build a CTE high school yet because the plans are sitting in the city engineer's office. When, when Dr. Bracey briefed that a year ago, the briefing indicated that we would be teaching in the CTE high school this September. That's a month ago. Okay, we don't even have the first bit of construction started because we're still in the plan review. And so, fingers crossed, we'll be teaching there in September next year. But until we collectively get a plan together and go build this school, we ain't teaching nothing in there. And so, so I don't want to use the uh, reserve fund to buy schools. It's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do for those big CIP projects that you all have, which are buying schools, is to fold those requirements into the city requirements for buying a new city hall or buying a new public service uh, facility or buying a new whatever. Uh, and then some of that's going to require us to make some debt decisions uh, for those big projects. And that's why it needs to be all folded together and, and integrated into the master CIP book. Uh, for the city. And so my suggestion, $5 million a year, no more. $20 million in the fund, no more. Um, that if you don't publish budget details, then the deal is null and void. So you need to publish budget details at the same time as the city publishes budget details so that we can take a look at the rest of the budget with you, not to, to uh, cut 
teachers or cut salaries or cut anything, but to just look at the budget and try to figure out, hey, uh, is there any soft spot in this budget that could be used to help pay the $14 million a year that you're going to ask us for, that you frankly have already asked us for, to do the, the teacher step increases. And by the way, teachers, I support the teacher step increase. I was, I was appalled to see the step ladder that Dr. Bracey briefed at the superintendent briefing of needs last year, because there's only $4,300 between the starting pay of a brand new teacher and a 35 year teacher, according to that step ladder. And so, so we got to fix that. And I agree we got to fix that. And it ain't going to be easy to fix that because we gave you $15 million extra this past year to pay for a whole bunch of stuff. And now you're asking for an additional $14 million a year, not just one time, but every year to cover the salary increases. And so that's another conversation that we started yesterday during the school board liaison meeting, but that frankly, we need to have us and you all together to try to figure out how do we make that very important priority into the budget this coming year so that we can go do what we need to do to make sure that we're being fair to uh, to our our uh, staff and get and paying them for the experience that they have accumulated over 10 20 30 or 40 years so so all of this is just to provide you the rationale behind why did i provide mr carter uh, the comments back to him that I provided. Uh, and, uh, and now I wish Mr. Carter and Dr. Bracey uh, the very best in working out the, the details with a hope that, uh, that, that when it all comes together, you get what you want, which is uh, CIP uh, reserve fund. We get what we want, which is all the CIP projects laid on the table transparently and folded in and prioritized with all the rest of the city CIP and then together we go figure out together how to uh, to solve the teacher pay uh, step increase problem so thanks again for uh, for coming tonight and thanks for listening yeah thank you I was going to dr. Patillo you have the floor sir thank you thank you mr. mayor uh, I'm trying to regurgitate everything you stated but uh, the first thing I heard you use the phrase guardrails uh, Guardrails are normally used for someone that's driving reckless. And we, we, we've never driven reckless as a school board. Uh, we provide the finance reports every month to council. I was never made aware that you didn't know the details of the budget. Uh, you mentioned you didn't know what was inside the cake. Uh, my grandmother was an excellent chef. In order to know what's inside the cake, you got to ask the chef. And so, so I, I, I was never told that you all didn't have the details of the budget. We used to have monthly meetings between the city manager and Dr. Bracey. Not speaking of you, Mr. Carter, you just got here. But Ms. Terry, the previous city manager, never held a meeting with Dr. Bracey. So you probably don't know me of the intricate details. We would like those meetings to start again. When you have liaison meetings, if Dr. Bracey is gonna be present, the city manager should also be present. I, I say this with all due respect, but Dr. Brace doesn't answer to the council, he answers to the school board. So that needs to be in place if you're gonna have those meetings to get an understanding. <clears throat> As a board, we get together and go through our budget by detail, and I will grant you that it should be posted on the website. But if there's ever any confusion on the budget, we're adults, just ask. We're willing to sit down and meet and talk. Last year I asked for quarterly meetings between the school board and city council. That has, not, that has yet to happen. And I think that will alleviate these types of conversations from happening. Uh, your presentation of unencumbered funds, I wish it would have had how many of those were vacancy savings on the unencumbered funds. No, there were I, not funds that were, not, that were poorly used or misspent. We've had a teacher shortage prior to COVID. In the budget, the things that were listed under CIP, we approve a CIP list every single year. He goes over that list during meetings with Mr. Wright, who does a great job, he's only one man. Why is not in your CIP book? That's a city staff issue, not a school board issue. We approve it every year. The reason why we didn't spend CIP as much in prior years, 
we were, we were good stewards of federal money from COVID relief. So we repaired a lot of our own CIP projects with that money not having to come to the city to put another strain on you. The 15 million you gave us last year was a one-time infusion. That cannot be used when talking about compensation because compensation is going to be an increase every single year, not a one-time allocation. And I don't want the, the public to be confused by that. We're asking for partnership and your opinion matters and everyone else's opinion matters. But in order to get something that works, you're right, we have to come together on that. And I don't see how city council could ever vote on anything concerning the schools if we don't talk together about it. Again, you won't know what the CIP needs are unless you come and see them, unless you're meeting with us to talk about it. The playgrounds that were replaced, that's in the budget that were encumbered, they were budgeted. Why? Because we did not have playgrounds that were ADA compliant for our growing special ed population. So we needed to replace all of them so they're ADA compliant. But if we would have had that conversation, that's something that we could have detailed for you all. All I'm trying to say is the communication has been poor. And because of that, that's why we found ourselves here every year. So we're trying to work together to put together an ordinance that works for both parties. That's fair for both parties. We cannot replace more than one roof a year with $5 million. I will say that. You, you can check the price of the West Haven roof. So to put a stipulation on what our minimum should be or our maximum should be, cannot be determined unless you see what our needs are in those schools. We have teachers that are underpaid, but also working in poor environments because HVAC needs to be replaced. Roofs need to be replaced. And you cannot say, hey, we'll give you five million as your max or 20 million as your max for a lifetime when you have one school that has 20 million worth of work. That you, you, you can't explain that. It sounds good and rational, to, to some of you, but to those of that are there every day, that work every day, who kids that have asthma and go home early every day, tell their parents that we only worth five million a year for CIP. Thank you. Vice Mayor Lucas Burke, ma'am, you have the floor. And Chairman Patillo, Chairman Patillo, Dr. Bracey, and uh, CFO Falk. Could you all remain there? Because there may be some additional questions. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. And, and, could, 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 I, could I follow up since... since you, yeah. Sir, 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 you can follow up, and then we're going to give the floor because we, yeah. we, we have... Mr. Mayor, just a point of order. Uh, Mr. Huber has already spent quite a bit of time, I think... Uh, and Dr. I understand Michello that, can, but, so but, but we're, having a con we're, we're having a right. conversation. Right, but I just want to make sure that you allow others to speak before Ms. Hugo. Sir, he took up quite I, a bit of time. I absolutely am, am going to do that, but I wanted him to end his, if he had one more follow-up, let's get that done. Everyone else will have a chance to speak, I assure you. Sir, please, please go ahead and proceed. Yeah, uh, two points to follow up with you, Chairman Patillo. First mm -hmm. off, out of the 15 million last year, 10 million of that was salaries. That's not one time, that's everlasting. He gave a salary increase across the board and we're not taking it away this year. So 10 million of that 15 million is an everlasting burden. And now we're gonna talk about finding 14 million more. I'm sorry, a, a, a financial burden, not a burden to the city. Okay, so it's right. something that we have to find the money for. We found the money for it this year and we committed when we decided that we were gonna give a 7% pay raise this year, we ain't taking it back. We're gonna keep giving it year over year. And so going forward, that $10 million bill is gonna be part of, of what we're committed and we committed when we approved that, that budget to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to fund forevermore. Um, and, and regarding uh, the, the, the uh, CIP projects, the, 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 the rest of the work that needs to be done in the buildings, I don't doubt that you have a long laundry list of CIP. All I'm asking is put it into the book. And if, and if. Put it into the book. Uh, uh, so, so whatever we need to do to get it into the, the city's budget book and laid into the, the, the city priorities, I, I, I want to help do that. Because at the end of the day, we just want to get the whole picture 
into the CIP book so that we're making priority judgments uh, to, to, to cover the sewers and, the, and the, the, uh, the school buildings. No, I totally agree. My point was that we have submitted that list. Why, why it has not made to the book? Again, that's a city staff issue, but I don't want the public thinking that we have not provided that. We have. I even asked during budget season, have we submitted the CIP list? They tell me when they meet with Mr. Wright about the CIP list. Why it's not in your book, I don't know. Okay. Thank you, sir. Dr. Whitaker, you have the floor, sir. Uh, yes, um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Patillo and Dr. Bracey, Mr. Falk. Uh, just want to make sure, as, as well as the public, that one council person's directive, uh, the guardrail, that does not speak for council. And so I, I just want to make it clear that my expectation as a council person is that we have professionals who are qualified to run our school district, both at the administrative, at the teaching level, and at the financial level. I expect to get financial information from those who are professionals to present financial information. And so I'm waiting to hear back from your side where you have professional financial persons in place to give us recommendations about how this ordinance should be worded. And I want it worded as a council person who values education in a way that's going to help to continue moving the district forward and in a way that it will not be uh, any type of back and forth that we can move forward together. And so uh, I appreciate you, Dr. Patillo, uh, for what you have shared this evening because a lot of times when information goes out to the public like just was given, and the public does not do any type of in-depth analysis, they tend to come back with misinformation. And so I appreciate what you have done this evening. And again, I look forward to getting the information back from the school district. Thank you, sir. Vice Mayor Lucas Burke, ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, Dr. Patillo, Dr. Bracey, CFO Falk, thank you for your presence as well as our educators who are here today. As a person who has served on the City Council for the past eight years, I have been one to fund, fully fund our schools. So I understand what you're presenting to us today. And I learned a long time ago, I think on my first year on the City Council, that our school board was elected to be our school board and our city council was elected to be the city council and that we should not dibble and dabble or um, appropriately, misappropriately tell you how to manage your budget. I think that would be um, um, misappropriating and um, us doing that ineffectively as a council. Um, I believe that the ordinance is in place um, with the lines that are there to, to restrict any amount would be the same thing as you having to come back to us for the reappropriation. So I agree that we need to move forward with the, with the reappropriation as requested. I believe also that um, on the fall festival that I attended this weekend, I spoke to some educators who are working in some schools with poor air quality that have mold and that there have students that have asthma and they're not able to attend and the deplorable conditions of some of the pictures that I saw, you know, made me know that we're derelict in not being able to help you all um, to reach uh, that status. So I'm in agreement with the ordinance as it stands. I agree that our city manager needs to come to the table with you all um, and we will not um, mismanage uh, what is your job to do. Um, I believe that you are elected to do the jobs that you have presented to us and our, our job is to fund the superintendent's estimate of needs annually when he comes to us. Uh, we don't need to go in and micromanage anybody's budget because that's not our job to do. Um, so I appreciate you being here and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. And if I may, um, I'm, this is gonna be the last comment that we make because we need to move on. First of all, I wanna thank you, Chairman Patillo. Dr. Bracey and CFO Falk. And I wanna thank our teachers. I wanna thank each and every one of you for the work you do every single day on behalf of our children. You guys are doing an amazing job. And 
as I understand it, and Mr. Falk, you will agree, when I first came on council, one of the first things I did was call a meeting to meet with you and Dr. Bracey to understand what school funding was really all about and understand the challenges that the schools were facing. It's critically important, number one, that we take care of our people. And we take care of our people and we show them value by paying them their worth. And I think everyone on this council is in full agreement with that. Over my six years on council, I have always supported education. My two grandchildren are in Portsmouth Public Schools, and I can assure you that will not change. But what I want to say is, to Chairman Patillo's point, and Dr. Bracey, and we have all had conversations over the years, you are right, sir. We all need to be better in our communication and how we work together. Because at the end of the day, the children are watching and everybody else is watching, and we have a responsibility as leaders to do that. And so you have the commitment, I know of this council, you have heard it, and, and that has never changed with me. You will have the commitment of our, our CEO to work collaboratively with Dr. Bracey, and, and we hope, and it is our desire, to come to a place where we are in full support of one another. I'm not going to look backwards. I'm not looking in the rearview mirror. I'm looking forward, as I know you are, sir, and, and, and Dr. Bracey and the CFO Falk. But, but it's our time. It's our time to do the work that we are supposed to do, and we are all committed to that. So thank you. Thank you for bringing all of this to our attention. Our children deserve the best environment. Our teachers deserve the best environment. And you all, sir, deserve the best support. So thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. Before, before they go, Mr. Mayor, I just want, before they go, there are th um, three agenda items um, this evening, I believe. Um, voting to uh, make some reallocations. Is that is it five to the school back to the schools, and and um, we are saying we are supporting education. Um, so are we prepared as a council tonight to reallocate the requests, those five requests that are going to be made tonight? S sir, I, I I can't speak for every council member. So can but, we take a but 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 hold, can we hold, take a consensus be, be, before to, we take a consensus? What what I can share with you, what I heard during the discussion, was that the majority of council, and I would agree with the majority of council, are ready to reappropriate. And I would even go a little bit further just to add to that. Over my six years on council, when the question of reappropriated reappropriations have showed up, there has never been a contention that we should not reappropriate the funds to our schools because we understand to Chairman Patillo's conversation, sometimes those funds don't get expended for valid reasons. And so I would say that based on the conversation that we had, we have a majority already okay. that is going to approve the I just want to make sure, um, because when we say that, I've, I've heard some conversation that, there, that may not occur. And I just want to make sure that while uh, we have our teachers here, VEA, uh, PEA, that we go on record just as a consensus. If you feel that you're going to support it, can we, because they may not be here this evening, can we at least show that we are going to support them? If If it is the pleasure of the majority on council, sir, um, we can call for a consensus, and I will do that at this time. Yes, sir. So. Can I see a, a, a consensus by show of hands of all who will support the reappropriation? The five reappropriations on the agenda for this evening. Okay. Yeah. And also, Mr. Moody has the floor. Well, you, did you, did we? I think we took the count already. Did we what was the, the count? can you raise? I didn't see it. Okay. I didn't see it. I, okay, that's There you great. go, sir. Right. Thank, Thank you, sir. Mr. Moody, you did want the floor, so, so you have the floor. Well, I, th I think there's one more item of business. It was mentioned that this, we have an ordinance before us, and I think it was mentioned that apparently uh, our partners in the school system, uh, unless I'm mistaken, were you we all party to constructing this ordinance? Yes. What was that? Did you take part in, in, in any of the wording on the ordinance? No. Okay, I, I would think the next step, if we want this to be a joint endeavor, would be to set up a timetable when the ordinance 
uh, can be brought back to us with input from our school uh, partners. Well, I think that as we went through the discussion, that was made clear. If no, that was no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Hold on, Mr. Mayor, Moody. Mayor was not made clear. Uh, hold, hold on, Mr. Moody. I, I understand what you're saying, but I was going to refer back to Chairman Patello because I understand, and you can correct me, sir, if I didn't hear you correctly, that there were going to be discussions between our, our CEO, Mr. Carter, Bracey. and our superintendent, Dr. Bracey, to come back with the language that was agreeable. Is that, is, is that kind of accurate, sir? On our part, well, yes. Right, and, and then once that language is reviewed, mm -hmm. a ultimate vote and decision would be made on the ordinance, sir. Mayor, what's the timetable for that? I, I'm not I'm not certain on the timetable, sir, but I, I do know we need to give those two individuals the opportunity to get together, and once they can get together and discuss that, I think then it is reasonable to expect that they can come back with a timetable that we can all be comfortable with. Is that acceptable or is that not acceptable? That's acceptable. Okay. Councilman Tillard, sir, you have the floor. Um, I would, I don't, I personally would like to see a timeline at it, um, just so things don't get lost in, um, in situations. Cause I mean, I've been on council for a year and a half and it's been lost for a year and a half. And so um, I would ask that this council add a timeline of, um, I think between now and the next city council meeting on November the 12th. Mr. Carter, sir, would you like to speak to that please? Yes, sir. I'm, I I would ask for at least 30 days on this. I This is a conversation I have never had before. So uh, in order to do that, uh, I'm not saying it can't be done by then. If the council says have it back by then, we'll have it back by then. But I'm going to ask for 30 days instead. So instead of that, uh, maybe the first meeting in December, if, if the council is agreeable to that. Since And since we are fostering this relationship, Dr. Bracey, do you have any thoughts on that? Because you will be in discussion with the manager. So I want to certainly give you an opportunity, sir. No, I'm, <clears throat> I'm fine with the, the timeline. I mean, if, if you all say you want it done by the 12th, I'll clear my schedule and make it happen. So we can make it happen if it's November 12th or 30 days. You know, we're okay. ready to go to work. Councilman yeah. Tillage and my colleagues, would it be would be would it be okay to ask both Dr. Bracey and Mr. Carter? Um, I know they said that they'll convene very soon. Perhaps that could be tomorrow. I don't know. But in any event, they could come up with a time frame at that point. I'll would take that, Mr. I'll take Mr. Carter's recommendation of the December the third. Okay. Well, that's fine, sir. I just wanted to make sure that everyone had a chance to weigh in. The, night, the next meeting is the 10th of December. Okay, sir. so December the 10th. Very good, sir. Thank you. And look, once again, I want to thank you all for always leading in the right way and giving us an opportunity to hear your concerns, and it's appreciated. Thank you. We now have a motion to go into a closed session. Well, first, we generally ask if there are council liaison reports. So I would, I would ask, are there any council liaison reports at this time? I don't see any, so that being the case, we do have a need to go into closed session. And Vice Mayor Lucas Burke, ma'am, would you please read the closed session motion? I will. I move to go into a closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-3711A8 for the purpose of consultation with legal counsel employed by the city regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel specifically regarding the possible amendment of the city code to eliminate use valuation and assessment of open space land. Thank you, ma'am. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. I would ask that my colleagues please vote electronically. This item is adopted 6-0. Thank you, ma'am. Colleagues, we are in closed. Madam Vice Mayor, yes. would you please read the certification motion? I will. I hereby move that each council member certify that to the best of his or her knowledge, one, only pub 
public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting just concluded. Second. We have a motion and a second. I would ask that my colleagues please vote electronically. Six members of council approved. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And we do have one more item, and Mr. Carter, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I am pleased to announce that we have with us our new uh, Director of Social Services, Ms. Hinaya Westbrook. Would you stand and be recognized? Uh, she comes to us with over 25 years in public service uh, and uh, an extensive background in local departments of social services. She has gone through an extensive uh, search process and interview process and was uh, came highly qualified and, and we're really pleased to have you on board. Mm -hmm. Again, Ms. Shania uh, Manigot Westbrook. Mm -hmm. okay. Welcome aboard, ma'am. Welcome aboard. Are there any more items, uh, Mr. Carter? No, sir, that concludes our, our, everything I have for the work session today. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you all for coming tonight to hear our work session, and we thank you for your participation. This meeting is now adjourned, and we will reconvene at our regularly scheduled council meeting at 7 o'clock p.m.